mahadhara wa kwanza ambao utatolewa na shekhe wetu Dr. Ali Dina kwa hiyo tunamuomba Dr. Asogee kwa ajili ya kutupatia kile ambacho ametutayarishia baada salawati ala Muhammadin wa alihi tayyibin tahirin أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا محمد وآله الطاهرين respected guest of honor his excellency Sheikh Abdullah Nasser, the other respected scholars on the high table, the invited guests, my dear fellow brother scholars and students and brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. It is our duty as students, as scholars, to always appreciate the ni'mah that Allah grants us. من لم يشكر المخلوق لم يشكر الخالق. إمام زين العابدين عليه السلام says on the day of قيامة عبد من عبيد الله will come before Allah and Allah will ask him أشكرت فلانا did you acknowledge did you recognize did you appreciate the efforts of so and so person in your community. So that Abdun min Abidi, he will say, Bal shakar tuka ya Rabb. Oh Allah, I said, thanks to you that you gave us this ni'mah. And Imam alayhi salam says that Allah will reply, Lam tashkurni idh lam tashkurhu. If you have a sahib ni'mah and a person who has contributed and brought about blessings and bounties to the community. And if you do not respect and acknowledge and appreciate their efforts, then you have not thanked Allah. Why? Because Allah in his wisdom does not give ni'mah to everyone directly. He gives his ni'mah through different mediums, through different channels, through different individuals. And therefore to thank Allah is to thank also the medium who was chosen to deliver the ni'mah of Allah to us. In fact, Imam alayhi salam says, La'na on someone who does not recognize and appreciate the efforts. La'na Allahu. Qati'i sabili al-ma'roof. Why? Wa huwa al-rajul al-lazhi yusna' ilayhi al-ma'roof fa yakfuruh. Somebody receives goodness, contribution, guidance, help, donation. And the most important, of course, will be spiritual guidance. We receive that and we fail to recognize, we fail to appreciate, we fail to thank, we fail to support. Imam alayhi salam says, may the curse of God be on you. Why? Because you demoralize, because you demotivate, because you degrade the status of this contributor. And therefore you block the effect from reaching to other people. So as an introduction, I would like to thank the organizers for this program to have called the scholars and the students here to show appreciation for the great scholars we have in our community. I was given the task of addressing the basic question that yuzanu yawm al qiyamati Midadu al-ulama bidima'i shuhada On the day of judgment, when the hisab will be taken, the blood of the martyrs will be equivalent to the ink of the scholars. 
A tafsir of this hadith is another hadith which says that yushaffa' yawm al-qiyamah li thalatha. Allah will give the power to make shafa'a to three groups of people. Al-anbiya, thumma al-shuhada, thumma al-ulama. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> I made a mistake. Al-anbiya, thumma al-ulama, thumma al-shuhada. Using the wazen of the blood of the shaheed and the ink of the alim is the same no the ink of the alim is higher the blood of the shaheed is lesser Kwanini. because another hadith gives the tafsir faqihun wahid ashaddu ala shaytan min alf abid according to one riwayah Min sabi'ina alf abid, according to another riwayah. Aw min sabi'ina alf zahid, according to another riwayah. Or therefore, the shuhada, the shuhada have their role to play, but the alim plays a bigger role. How so? Notice that Allah in the Quran, the first thing he swears by, iqra bismi rabbik. Notice that Allah says, Noon wal qalami wa ma yasturoon. Allah swears, not by the blood of the shaheed, but by the pen and the ink of the scholar. Notice that Allah says, Ar Rahman. And then what? Khalaqal insan, but after the Quran, Allamahu al bayan. Insan is great because of the bayan, and of course the bayan comes from the Quran, and the Quran is from the Rahman. Why is it the alim is greater than the shaheed? Notice all the anbiya were ulama, many were shuhada, but not all of them. Why is alim even greater than the shaheed? Because the malaika notice when the superiority of the human being over the malaika had to be clarified, Allah challenges the malaika, Anbi'uni bi asma'iha'ula. The superiority of Adam over malaika was not based on the blood, it was based on the ink, on the ill. But I think the best explanation given of the role of the shuhada versus the role of the ulama is in the Quran in Surah Nisa, ayah number 69, where Allah says, وَمَنْ يُطِعِ اللَّهَ وَالرَّسُولَ فَأُولَٰئِكَ مَعَ الَّذِينَ أَنْعَمَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِمْ if you obey God totally, and therefore if you obey the messenger of God and the message of God completely, then you shall qualify to be in the company of those who have been given special ni'mah from Allah. And four groups are mentioned. أَنْعَمَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِمْ مِنَ النَّبِيِّينَ وَالصِّدِّقِينَ وَالشُّهَدَاءِ والصالحين. Four groups are mentioned. Lakini. These four groups are mentioned in sequence. First is the Nabi who receives the Naba and he delivers and he guides and he shows the path. Number two is that first believer, most committed believer, the Sadiq. No, the Siddiq, the one whose Amal Yusaddiq Qawla. The one who believes not only by saying La ilaha illallah, but every action in his life is an expression of submission to the true God, the Siddiq. But when you have a society with a Nabi and a Siddiq, then you have opposition, you have resistance, you have persecution, you have deviation, and therefore there must be a struggle, there must be a conflict, 
they must be jihad and they must be shahada. And therefore Allah says, Allahu alayhim min al One, and after that siddiqina two, was shuhada. Number three, after shahada, you get was salihin. Now you have a community of believers who are righteous, pious, virtuous. Notice the guidance of the Nabi to be delivered to the Salihin has to pass through two stages. One is the Siddiqeen and one is the Shuhada. But before the Shuhada, you need the Siddiq to be able to motivate and to train and to raise the Shaheed. So in conclusion, this hadith based on the guidance of the Quran is saying that the role of the ulama is not only equal to the blood of the shuhada but even higher in some aspects. And therefore allow me to apply this message to the life of Marhum Allama Hujjat al Islam wal Muslimin Sayyid. Saeed Akhtar Radawi, may Allah bless his station. If an alim is to be equal to a shaheed or even higher than a shaheed, then he has to be a mujahid. And therefore, we have in the riwayah that ulama u shi'atina murabituna fithahri. Those who are the true scholars of the mazhab of Ahlul Bayt السلام, they are in the state of jihad, they are right in the forefront facing the enemies of God. Which is right in the forefront with Iblis and his army of Ifrit. يَمْنَعُونَهُمْ عَنِ الْخُرُوجِ عَلَى الضُعَفَاءِ شِيَعَتِنَا They stop the Iblis and the Afarid from attacking the right faith and the right followers عَنْ أَنْ يَتَصَلَّطَ عَلَيْهِمْ إِبْلِيسُ وَشِيَعَتُهُ That they cannot attack and defeat and overpower the true followers so if an alim is equal to or higher than a shaheed, this alim has to be a mujahid, a murabit. Marhum Sayyid Sayyid Akhtar Radawi had several jihad in his life. The jihad of studying the right knowledge. I met Marhum when he came to Qom on one of his visits. So when I visited him in his private home, he was a guest of Ansariyan. During our meeting, he mentioned that when he was studying in India in the Hausa, he was a hard working student who used to get the top marks in class and especially in Ilmul Kalam. Ilmul Kalam is, you know, a logic based, philosophical, intellectual, academic subject. Difficult one, not an easy one. Brilliant, hardworking, achieving with performance. The Ustad who was the Mumtahin says that if there was marks more than a hundred, I would have given it to Sayyid. Jihad to study. Number two, after graduation, he goes and serves in the community as the Imam al Jama'a wal Jumu'ah, but he begins the jihad of writing bil qalam. There's a whole collection of his articles that he has written in the Urdu uh, magazines and journals, the religious journals of that time. In response to the shubuhat, which were being showered upon the madhab of Ahlul Bayt, that jihad had begun in India. And then he makes a migration to Tanzania, Tanganyika in 1959 goes to Lindi, 59, Arusha, 63, Dodoma, 65, Dar es Salaam, and then finally, the establishment of the Bilal Muslim Mission. 
This is a jihad also. In Surah Ankabut, chapter 29, Allah says that the jihad of Hijrah is not easy. For him, it was very comfortable to stay in India and to continue to do work in that environment. Many people, when they're asked to leave the comfort of their hometown, go out to the villages or to the dark parts of the world where there is no other alim or hausa or madrasa or where they're full of challenges, they, they hesitate. Sayyid was a mujahid in this field. Surah Ankabud, Ayah 56. Ya ibadi alladheena amanu inna ardi wasi'a fa iya ya fa'buduni. This is jihad number one. That you say, I don't want to stay in my home. I'm ready to go out and do tabligh, even though it may be uncomfortable and there are challenges. Jihad number two. Oh, but there are dangers either. This is a new land. I don't know. And especially those inner cities and the jungles. Right now, even now, you go to some of these shrine cities. Tanzania, the jungles, they are afraid. Ayah 57, كُلُّ نَفْسٍ ذَائِقَةُ الْمَوْتِ ثُمَّ إِلَيْنَا تُرْجَعُونَ Why are you afraid of death? Death is decreed by Allah. You can be in the battlefield, but if death is not decreed, you don't die. You can be in bed at home, but if death is decreed, you will die. Jihad against the fear of death. Ayah number 58, Allah says, وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ لَنُبَوِّئَنَّهُمْ مِنَ الْجَنَّةِ غُرَفًا Ya Rabb, I have a ghurfa here. I'm comfortable. <laughs> I don't want to take the trouble of traveling, of facing difficulties, of living in challenging places, of facing greater challenges, of opponents, of rivals of Ifrit, of Iblis. No, they believe that Allah gives them a ghurfa better than the ghurfa. No, he gives them ghurafa, multiple palatial homes in Jannah, tajri min tahtiha al-anhar, khalideen fiha, ni'ma, ajrul, mutakallimeen, mudda'een, la ni'ma, ajrul, there were many people in the Koja community who said we must do tabligh in the indigenous population. There were speakers who came from outside. Khaja Majid Latif Majid Ansari. I don't know Sayyid Ibn Hassan Jarchawi from Pakistan back in the 50s. They came to the Koja community and they told them you have a duty to make tabligh and deliver the message to the indigenous population. And Zakir Hussein Farooq from India in the 50s also came and told the Kojas, but many people come and speak, but who has the tawfiq to be able to do it? Ni'ma ajrul amilin, that mujahid who can overcome the fears and the obstacles. And finally in ayah number 59, الَّذِينَ الصَّبَرُوا وَعَلَىٰ رَبِّهِمْ يَتَوَكَّلُونَ They are firm, they are determined, they are resistant to all the challenges. And they take faith and trust in God. Sayyid, you are going to preach amongst the Africans. Uh, the Kojas may not like this. And Sayyid says, but my risk is not in the hand of Kojas. My risk is in the hands of God. This is Surah Ankabut. Ayah number 60. وَكَأَيٍ مِنْ دَابَّةٍ لَا تَحْمِلُ رِزْقَهَا Who is the one who gives risk? Koja or non-Koja? Or Allah? Ayatullah Jawadi Amuli is a great mufassir of the Qur'an. He says that Allah gives risk to the snake and to the spider and to the scorpion and to all these poisonous animals. You think Allah cannot give you risk? Where is your faith? This is the jihad of Iman Billah, that Iman is, that, that Allah is the Razzaq, Dhul Quwwatil Mateen. وَكَأَيَّنْ مِنْ دَابَّةٍ لَا تَحْمِلُ رِزْقَهَا 
الله يرزقها وإياكم وهو السميع العليم the jihad of Sayyid that when he arrived here he learned the local language and the local culture the Quran says that you cannot be a successful muballigh unless you know the local culture and language وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا مِنْ رَسُولٍ Surah Ibrahim, Ayah 14 وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا مِنْ رَسُولٍ إِلَّا بِلِسَانِ قَوْمِهِ لِيُبَيِّنَ لَهُمْ Sayyid began to, to learn Swahili. He told me in Lindi, he, he's, when, when he landed here in Tanzania, one of the first things he did is picked up a Swahili learning book. And then he sat for an official course to learn Swahili. And then he gave the exam of Swahili when he was in Lindi, his first posting. And he went for the examination, and the examiner says, the registrar for examination, Padri, you want to do exam in written exam or oral exam? Sayyid said, I will do the written exam. Padri, the oral exam is easy. Written is very difficult. Sayyid said, I will do the written exam. And Sayyid was successful in his writings and in his speeches in Swahili. Jihad of Tabligh with, through the local culture. And finally, the jihad that Sayyid did as a scholar. I would like to point out one khutbah of Amirul Mu'mineen in Nahjul Balagha, khutbah number 108. Imam alayhi salam describes the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi and because we believe that the ulama are aqrabu, aqrabu nasi darajatan ila al-anbiya Therefore, the example of the Nabi should apply to the ulama also. Imam alayhi salam says, the Prophet was tabibun dawwarun bitibbih qad ahkama marahimahu wa ahma mawasimahu yada'u thalika haythu al-haja ilayh min qulubin ummin wa athanin summin wa al-sinatin bukm the Prophet was a physician who used to move around, a peripatetic, barefooted physician who used to visit the sick and not wait for the sick to come to the physician. And he had in his medicine box all the necessary medicine updated and he could treat the spiritual illnesses of hearts which were blind and ears which were deaf and tongues which were dumb to speak the truth to hear the truth to see the truth and to understand the truth you may have a problem where there is sickness in the community but there's no physician or there's a physician but he's sitting in the dispensary waiting for the patients to come or no he is going to the patients but he doesn't have the medication or he has the medication but it is out of date or the medication is right but it is not of all the different varieties or he may have the medication but he's using it for the wrong people those who are really sick are suffering those who are lesser sick are being given medicine five conditions Imam alayhi salam mentions for an effective muballigh how the Holy Prophet was and how we saw in the example of Marhum Sayyid Mutatabi'un bidawaihi mawadi al ghafla. Many a times patients are sick but they don't know. Ghafla. Suddenly you discover, oh, he's got pressure, he's got a heart problem, he's got cancer. It's there but it's not detected. Ghafla. Mutatabi'un bidawaihi mawadi al ghafla. Sometimes, no, there's no ghafla. There's ilm. I have a problem. Yeah, but what do you do with the problem? How do you solve the problem? Hayra. He doesn't know what to do, how to find the solution to the problem. The tabib comes and says, No, this is your problem and this is your solution. 
Sometimes sick patients do not take advantage of the illumination and the enlightenment of the wisdom that God has given. وَلَمْ يَقْدَحُوا بِزِنَادِ الْعُلُومِ الثَّاقِبَةِ فَهُمْ فِي ذَلِكَ كَالْأَنْعَامِ السَّائِمَةِ وَالصُّخُورِ الْقَاسِيَةِ Sayyid Marhum was an effective mubalir. If you look at his, just as his, at his books, more than a hundred titles that he has written, the variety of topics that he has touched. Wherever there was haja, he would attend to it, he would address the spiritual, intellectual, social, moral illness, and he would bring his marham, the lotion to treat the wounds, or no, he would bring his mausim, his misam, if not the marham. When no marham works, you have to bring a misam, the final treatment. I would like to give an example. We had the honor to attend a few private classes with Marhum Sayyid. So we were studying in the university at that time. We were a group of medical and pharmacy uh, students. And Sayyid was gracious enough to give us time. We picked up topics which were, on which there was no guidance available in the written literature available to us. And Sayyid would conduct classes in ilmul kalam, in fiqh, effectively in such a way that we being trained in the university with an academic bent of mind were convinced. I will give you an example of a book that Marhum Sayyid has written back in the 70s but which is still effective even today. For example, in Usul al-Din, there's a book he has written in about the God of Islam. Simple language to understand but the arguments are profound. The Quran has one beautiful approach to tablir, and that is it uses simple language, but with arguments which are strong and profound and undefeatable. Sayyid had this time, his English language books, for example, were written in a language which the ordinary average educated person could be able to read and the arguments were strong and powerful. Arguments that he covers against the materialists, against the dualists, against the atheists, against the scientists, against the Darwinists. For example, Bertrand Russell. Russell has written a book, Why I'm Not a Christian. He says because he challenges all the arguments of Christianity, the cosmological, the teleological, the moral arguments about belief in God. And he says, I say, the conclusion of Russell, I say quite deliberately that the Christian religion as an organization in the churches has been and still is today the principal enemy of moral progress in the world. Russell refuted and rejected the Christian faith. And he says, for example, if a divine being does exist, then that divine being must have a cause which leads to infinite regression of causes. And therefore this undermines the use of this argument of the first cause to prove the existence of the supreme divine being. Sayyid quotes this argument in his book. And then Sayyid responds to it. Now imagine a student going to the university, impressed by the philosopher, the atheist, Bertrand Russell, reads the book, Why I'm Not a Christian, and the rejection of God, which is also the arguments we use to prove the existence of God as Muslim theologians. And then they say, whoa, now the student is attracted to atheism, and you don't have a powerful argument against that. Sayyid responds to that, what is a first cause, and how a first cause, by definition, is one which cannot have another cause and why the first cause is not materially constrained by time and space and is beyond the realm of time and space. But these are intellectual discussions. I just quoted it as an example of the depth of argument. He would scan and see where is the haja, where is the ghafla, where is the hayra and accordingly bring his marahim and mawasim to treat
those intellectual, social problems. Conclusion, and I end here. Imam Sadiq alayhi salam says, Sittatun yalhaqna al-mu'mina ba'da wafatih. Six things a mu'min does in his lifetime. Once he leaves the dunya, his record of deeds are open and all the a'mal are written in his record of deeds. Number one, waladun yastaghfiru lah. And alhamdulillah, Sayyid has left behind sons who are carrying on his work in some way or the other. Wa mus'hafun yukhlifu. He leaves behind a manuscript He's written the Quran by himself and he's left it behind as a legacy for the guidance of posterity. Number three, you plant a seed, that seed will germinate, it'll give out shoots and roots and a tree will grow and branches and fruits. Bilal Muslim mission, for example, is a gharsun yagrisu. Number four, sadaqatu ma in yujri. You begin the charity whose effect is continuous. The fact that he could convert and help in the conversion of several of the shuyukh. For example, Shaykh uh, Ali Juma Mayunga. May Allah protect our ulama. Shaykh Mayunga told me, said once that if you want the evidence, the living evidence of the effectiveness of marhum sayyid look at me how i how he managed to discuss with me and show me from the references gradually slowly step by step without forcing me to finally reach the truth and accept the mazhab of the ahlul bayt and number five you dig deep into the earth till you reach water sayyid had a habit of studying consistently, of doing research. Today, if I read his books, I'm amazed at the references that he was able to access, not only in the Arabic or Farsi languages, but also in the English languages. And finally, number six, وَسُنَّةٌ يُؤْخَذُ بِهَا مِنْ بَعْدِهِ And I think the best sunnah the Sayyid has left behind is his unique jihad, mujahid, Murabit, Alim, Muballigh, that he was here in Tanzania and beyond Tanzania. And therefore, his contribution becomes equal, if not more, than that of the Shuhada. Let's pray to Allah for Tawfiq to be able to be inspired by these great scholars. And of course, we have in our presence the great personality of Shaykh Abdullahi also. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Tuna mshukuru Dr. Alidina. Wa kalima yake. Maudhu ya msingi ilikuwa ni elimu ya wanachuuni inangufu zaidi kuliko damu ya shahidi. Na taba'an, kama vile ambavyo kupitia damu wanadamu wanaishi, kupitia ilimu wanachuoni wanaishi maisha mengine ambao hawakufikia katika mustawa wao wanakuwa wafu kwa lile.